about the fossil record and general features of geology, and there's a whole bunch of rabbit trails in here. So I doubt we'll get finished tonight, but we'll make as much progress as we can. So, number one, fossils are rock, pretty much. There are exceptions to that rule, um, which we'll talk about. But most, the vast majority of fossils are completely mineral. There's no organic remains whatsoever. Um, and most of the fossils that we have, as we saw in the video a couple weeks ago, uh, most of the fossils are marine bivalves, clams, uh, or monovalves, snails. Okay? There are very few um, of any mammals or any vertebrates. Okay? However, we find hundreds of thousands of tons of fossils that we've found so far. So the fossil record is quite extensive. Uh, there are lots of mammal fossils out there, lots of reptile fossils, and more than one has been proposed as evidence of macro evolution. As a matter of fact, there was an evolutionist one time that said the perfect cure for creationists was to take a trip down the Grand Canyon. You can see the different layers and the different fossils in there, and it's just obvious to anybody with an open mind that these creatures evolved one from another, and they're separated by millions of years, and all that nonsense. Um, I think a perfect cure for an evolutionist is to take a trip down the Grand Canyon, but we'll talk about that, why I think that, um, in this chapter, okay? So, <clears throat> get a little background here. Evolution as a theory of origins, or what I'm going to call macroevolution, macro meaning large, you know, species evolving into more species, different kinds, adding complexity. Macroevolution comes in three basic flavors. Okay, this is so important that you understand this. Not all evolution is created equal. The first um, that was a scientific theory was Darwinism. Okay, um, back in the 1850s. 1859 is when Darwin published The Origin of the Species. America had better things to do. We were about to fight the Civil War, so we didn't care. But Europe cared a lot. Um, it's also important for us to, re to remember this is the first scientific theory of evolution. A philosophical theory of evolution goes back at least to the Greeks, probably the Hindus. So evolution as a theory of, or as a philosophy of origins has been around um, as long as anything. Okay? Uh, Paul argued with evolutionists on Mars Hill. No doubt in my mind about that. Okay? Now, when Darwin comes out with his original theory, his mechanism for change was what he called use and disuse. Okay? So in other words, he argued that if you had some kind of horse thing, and it's out in the savanna, and it's trying to get the leaves at the top of the trees, and it's stretching its neck out a little bit further, and a little bit further, <laughs> every day, then eventually it would evolve into a giraffe over what he, well, back then he called them thousands of years. Right? Because millions of years hadn't been invented yet. Okay, <clears throat> so um, that was his mechanism for change, use and disuse. That was Darwinism. Nobody believes that anymore. Okay, so then science happened. Um, Gregor Mendel did, actually was a contemporary of Darwin. It's interesting if these guys have ever met what they would think of each other. Um, anyway, Gregor Mendel um, did a lot of work with pea plants in many, many years. And he figured out, he cracked the code of how characteristics were passed from parents to offspring. He called them factors, we now call them genes. Okay? And at that time, there was no known way to change your genes. So in other words, if um, you know, you're going to pass the, the genetic information on to your offspring, there's, there's no way that you can change that. It's fixed. You can stretch your neck out as much as you want. Your kids are going to have normal sized necks. You can work out and be healthy and eat right, quote unquote, as much as you want. Your kids are going to have the same health as every other kid. The genetic material is passed on from parents to offspring, does not change, period. Okay? Except for mutations. But um, those are all almost always bad. So when they figured out that. You know, you can't evolve a giraffe from a horse just because it's stretching its neck out every day. They freaked out. They had a little bit of a panic moment because they've been teaching evolution in Europe for 60 some odd years at this point. It's been ingrained into all the universities. People have lived and died teaching evolution. 
Um, they had doctorates of evolution, they still do. So this was a crisis, okay? They no longer have a way to change these organisms. There were also some studies done about the same time where they cut off the tails of mice, of carving knives. Um, I don't know what they used, but um, uh, mice, uh, mice don't really use their tail. You know, if, you, if you read Narnia, the, the mice has a sense of pride with his tail. That's about, that's about it, right? There's no nerves in the tail, there's no muscles in the tail. They don't use it for anything. So the evolution is like, well, let's just speed up evolution here, and we'll chop all our tails off, and they'll have babies, and we'll chop all their tails off, and eventually we'll have a tailless mouse. Which is, of course, ridiculous. Because they're not changing the genetic information, they're just you know, torturing the mouse. I don't think it hurt the mice, but anyway. They got through several dozen generations of mice, and still they all have tails, and the question is, how much time are these scientists willing to spend on this? They figured out, yeah, yeah, yeah that's not working. Problem. So, <clears throat> at the big convention, they all got together and they came up with what we call neo-Darwinism. Evolution by mutation. Okay? This is what's taught in every public school in America. Every single one. Okay? I ran into Christians in high school, I still run into Christians all over the place. Oh, I don't believe in evolution. They can't even tell the difference between evolution and science. It is so ingrained into our culture, most people don't even think about, oh yeah, millions of years, hmm, I guess that is kind of a difference from what the Bible says. Um, approximately a third of a biology textbook is nothing but evolution theory. Okay, and that's what it is, evolution by mutation, all right? There is actually a third theory that most people have never heard about, and this one came uh, actually from the paleontologists who were studying the fossils. Biologists came up with macro or uh, with neo-Darwinism, trying to change the genome with mutations. Oh, well, if you have a beneficial mutation, it, it will enable this species to survive. It's survival of the fittest. So, you know, this species or this particular individual of the species is going to survive better than the other individuals, and so his genetic information is going to get passed on, whereas the other ones are going to die out over millions of years. They had invented millions of years by this point. Over millions of years, the evolution of a new species. Unfortunately, the paleontologists had a little bit of what you might call a problem with that worldview, because they did not see this gradual change in the fossil record. Let's look what they had to say. As is now well known, <clears throat> most fossil species appear instantaneously in the fossil record, persist for some millions of years, his words virtually unchanged, only to disappear abruptly. He called this punctuated equilibrium. Uh, this was a term developed by Eldridge and Gould and others, Stephen Gould being one of the greatest paleontologists to ever walk the face of the earth, a devout evolutionist, and he said, there's no evidence for evolution by mutation in the fossil record. He was so adamant about it, he came up with a third theory of evolution. He called it punctuated equilibrium, which is a fancy way of saying, or oh, equilibrium is what? Sameness. You're maintaining the status quo, man. Nothing is changing. Everything's cool. So equilibrium is nothing's happening, and punctuation is like extremely abrupt, halting change. Right? So Gould is basically arguing that one day a T-Rex laid an egg and now hatched a chicken. That's his theory. Now, it's not quite that, much, that ridiculous, but basically that's what he's saying. There's no evidence in the fossil record of transitional forms, so I have another theory of evolution, and that, and that is that evolution actually happened too fast for it to be fossilized. Except for most of the time, it doesn't happen at all. <laughs> anyway, uh, you, know, you notice when this was published? Hmm, did you guys know about this before today? No. Well, why does he say that it's well known? In 1985! Because the paleontologists all knew about it. Every paleontologist knew that this is what happens. You guys don't know, though, because they don't tell you about it. Hmm. Interesting. So, 
This is a problem <clears throat> for phyletic gradualism, meaning evolution by mutation. So if, that's a big if, that if could cover the state of Texas three or four times. If organisms can evolve by small little minute changes in their genes, the fossils should show that indisputably. The fossil record should be the greatest evidence for evolution. Should be. In fact, the entire fossil record should be nothing but intermediate forms. You shouldn't be able to tell the difference between cats and dogs down there. That's millions of years ago. They have to be the same thing, or some kind of half dog, half cat. You shouldn't be able to tell the difference between bats and squirrels. They have to be the same thing down there. That's millions of years ago, bro. <clears throat> so, the fossils don't show that, however. So Stephen Gould came up with a different theory. Him and, and several other paleontologists, people who are actually studying, I don't know, the evidence. He argued there's no evidence for evolution by mutation of the fossil record. You can check it out on Wikipedia. There's also a link here. Um, to a creationist website. So, so basically what we're saying here is, and, and I've, if you're one of my students, you've probably heard this before. All right, so you're walking along giant canyon with one of your friends, and you're just kind of chatting and small talk, and what's happening, and the uh, whole house is going, and oh, isn't it beautiful scenery over here? And all of a sudden, you look up, and your friend is on the other side of the canyon. And you're like, Right? You have to wait for the sound to travel, that new process the information. And they're like, oh, I jumped! <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. What are you, Tigger? Uh, this, is not, this is not a jumpable distance. Well, let's say it's a mile. It's not in this picture, but this is the best I can do. Fit on this slide, OK? <laughs> He's like, oh, no, 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 I jumped. <clears throat> Look over here. There's a bunch of little stepping stones. Okay, now it's possible to jump, isn't it? If you can break this thing up into a series of small steps, then maybe it's possible for him to have made his way across the canyon. It's going to take him a little bit more time. He's much more likely to fall and break his neck. Several other important pieces of himself, right? But maybe it's possible. This is, this is evolution by mutation, or um, the first theory, right? Darwinism. A series of small changes over long periods of time will eventually get to a big change. Right? This seems logical enough. Except we don't have any of these little pieces anymore. All we see are gaps in the fossil record. And that's what these paleontologists are so upset about. So, we'll, get, we'll talk more about paleontologists in a second. It's time to educate ourselves about what all of this fossil business is about. A fossil is the remains of a once living organism. You can see these things being formed at Walmart and um, other, other, I'm sorry, <laughs> anyway, so this is, a, this is a piece, it's a clue. So over 80% of fossils are less than one bone. Okay, you don't have anything like a complete articulated skeleton, not even close. Okay, if you find a fragment of a skull, that's a huge, that's a big deal in paleontology. Uh, so, it tells us something about the past, but we won't have the whole picture, like in archaeology. All you, all you have is what's left of their house. You know, you're, you're not going to know him on a first name basis. You're not going to know what color his hair was. There are lots of things, you know, well, what he ate for breakfast. There are lots of things you're just not going to know about those people. Well, same thing for fossils. Okay? Uh, fossils are exceptions to the general rule when organisms die. They decay, right? The carbon cycle. This is why I don't understand why Christians are so uptight about whether they get buried or whether they're cremated. It's the same thing. <gasps> but cremation was a pagan practice. Listen, listen, pal. The Israelites buried people because they had caves and no wood. Okay? The pagans burned people alive. Burned, not alive. <laughs> they did that too. They burned people after they died. <laughs> uh, it's been a long week. I gotta quit saying that. Um, they burned people because they didn't have any caves, but they had lots of wood. Anyway, this is the same thing. It's all the carbon cycle. I don't care if you bury yourself, you're just slowing it down for a couple of decades, maybe. Your carbon will be recycled. 
slanted. So most organisms, when they die, they decay. Pretty much. <clears throat> so, most common type of fossil is the mold slash cast fossil. This particular type of fossil is completely inorganic. So you have, uh, for example, a bivalve. Clam, living down at the bottom of the ocean, minding his own business, and poof! He gets, it gets buried in waterborne sediment, and he thinks, well, this is a bad day, right? And uh, he doesn't quite make it, and he dies. And he's buried under a mile of rock or something like that. And he decays, completely decays away, leaving behind a mold, okay? And most of the time, this is a sedimentary rock, water can percolate through the rock, and it will deposit minerals inside that little cavity. So you'll have a fossil that's really more like a cast. Well, it is a cast of the basic outline of what the organism looked like. Okay. Um, uh, these fossils are only a small fraction of organisms that lived, of course. Um, now, another type of fossilization is petrification. This is far rarer. Uh, but in this process, we're actually converting organic material into rock. So we actually have some, say for example, the carbon. We saw that with the Malachite Man, right? The area around the bones is stained, or I guess you could say it's, uh, it's um, colored differently, right? Because, because of petrification that's taken place. We have converted some of that organic material. Okay, so these tip fossils typically are better preserved, right? Um, it can be a bone or a tooth that's petrified. We find lots of petrified wood. In fact, there are areas of the world where you find entire petrified forests. I think uh, they have one up in Nova Scotia. Uh, sometimes this process can happen very quickly and preserve some organic remains within the fossil, which we'll talk about in more detail. It only happens with well-preserved specimens, but it can give us uh, more information than we usually find. And um, I believe it's not showing up there. Let me see if we can change that. Maybe. There it goes. Oh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> One way to scan a cat. I should know. Have you guys had one? Hello, what's up? I'll talk to you later. See ya. <clears throat> yeah, is Nova a uh, creationist organization or are they are they older or over there? seen an advertisement and uh, thought I should go buy that thing. <laughs> Never. <laughs> yeah. Can I have a skip button, please? Sometimes I do. Yeah, no. Not on my YouTube, I guess. <clears throat> Anytime this month. I don't even know how long it is. And we'll, we'll probably skip around in the um, video a little bit because it's a little bit fruity. But.
looks like it's a graveyard. Hmm. Interesting. So these are very well preserved fossils. Very unusual to find fossils this well preserved. <clears throat> This is a typical fossil. It's completely mineral. Impossible. From 
millions of years. Think about it. Ooh. The laws of chemistry and biology and everything else that we know say that it should be gone. It should be degraded completely. But Schweitzer. Did you hear what she said? If you think about it, the laws of I've memorized this. The laws of chemistry and biology and everything else that we know say that it should be gone, it should be completely degraded. She's willing to throw out everything else so she can keep evolution. So that she can keep her millions of years. Now, I don't know if that's scientific, I would call that philosophical myself. That's just my opinion. Looking at searching for organic remains where no one had thought to look before. Her mentor is Jack Horner, one of the most famous this is where, dinosaur hunters in the world. Uh, Team that one dude in Jurassic Park was based on this. In the remote Montana Badlands, the massive leg bone had to be broken in half for transport. And Schweitzer got to test fragments from deep inside the bone. The T-Rex bone was filled with a very unique bone tissue. When I turned it you know, like that and looked down on it and saw this, this tissue that you can see right there in cross-section, I knew what it was. It's called medullary tissue, and it's what female birds build up in inside their bones as a source of calcium in the eggs they lay. Interesting. All dinosaurs laid eggs, and it made sense to Schweitzer that female dinosaurs produced the same kind of bone tissue. It looks different from the surrounding bone, and it meant the T-Rex had to be a mother expecting a clutch of dinosaur eggs. It was really exciting for me. I thought, there's nothing in my career that could possibly be cooler than being able to identify the first Oh, she was so wrong no about that. No one had ever identified medullary tissue in a dinosaur bone before. But to be sure, Mary Schweitzer directed her lab assistant to soak the bone sample in an acid solution to reveal its structure so she could study it. What happened next would change the way that scientists thought about fossils forever. As I was looking at the microscope, the medullary material was tech. no longer hard, and um, what was left was this curled piece of tissue that I was using forceps to try and flatten out. And when I poked into it, it was spongy. It was flexible what? tissue. Flexible tissue from a 68 million year old dinosaur. You're right, it's impossible. Blood vessels, they are transparent. I'm convinced. Hollow, pliable, flexible, branching blood vessels that contain small round red microstructures. She didn't call them red blood cells. <laughs> I said, this is not possible. Do it again. And that's the definition of insanity. We another piece of bone. We put it in the solution. We waited two or three or four weeks. Looked again. More blood vessels. What? We must have repeated that with probably 17 or 18 different fragments of bone. As soon as Schweitzer's what? discovery of dinosaur soft tissue was published, <clears throat> people thought of one thing. Yeah. When, pop quiz, when was Mary Schweitzer's work published? When did we first know about this? 85? It was the early 90s. And they make light of it in the movie, but the scientific world came down on her like a ton of bricks. She lost her job over this. She got another one eventually. Eventually, she was vindicated. Eventually, they had to admit that this exists. But they came down on her like a force to be reckoned with over this claim that she found soft tissues in bones that everyone understands are 70 million years old. Why? And she never called them red blood cells. Did you get that? And and uh, I think most of you have been out of biology or haven't taken biology for, for a while now. But you can look at them and say, those look an awful lot like red blood cells. Why didn't she call them red blood cells? Because red blood cells are 90% water. And uh, that, that other idiot, I'm sorry, the, um, the other scientist was talking about, um, it was clear to understand the possible biological processes is decay. What he failed to mention is <clears throat> these molecules are not stable. It's not just exposure to all this crazy stuff that happens in our world that causes these molecules to fall apart. They fall apart all by themselves. 
They're not stable. The gasoline in your gas tank falls apart after a while, doesn't it? You leave gas in your lawnmower over the winter, and you go try to start it in the springtime. No bueno. It's an organic molecule. It's pathetically simple compared to, I don't know, a single strand of DNA. I mean, we understand that uh, some of the DNA in the laboratories has degraded to the point that they can't do tests on it anymore. In the laboratory. Now, the police are going back and trying to crack all these cold cases with DNA evidence. They can't do it on all of them because the DNA has, fall has fallen apart. In a perfect place, in a perfect situation, humidity, climate control, all that stuff. But here we got a red blood cell in a 70 million year old bone. She doesn't call it a red blood cell. She calls it a little round red microstructure. <laughs> she goes to Great Lakes, did not call it a red blood cell. And I'll do you one better. Mary Schweitzer is a believing Christian. And so committed to evolution that she's willing to throw out all of the laws of biology and chemistry and physics. She's willing to throw all that away so she can keep evolution. Just boggles my mind, folks. The rocks are crying out. And these people can't hear them. You know, Jesus said, if, the, if somebody came back from the dead, these people would not believe. No kidding. Ah, anyway, so sometimes fossils are not rocks. Just occasionally. And boy, is that hard to stomach for the evolutionists. They just get really perturbed. And I showed this to my professor. She was just very upset with me. Very upset with me. Did you know that Mary Spicer just hates it that creationists use that? <laughs> uh, really? <clears throat> I don't really care. Why do I care about her feeling? I'm kind of concerned with the truth. Is it possible for these things to have survived millions of years? No. Is it possible for them to have survived thousands of years? No. I think this is the strongest evidence we have that dinosaurs survived the flood in great numbers. Possibly up to, I don't know, five or six hundred years ago. Where do, we, where do you think we got all these ideas for dragons? Every culture has legends of dragons. Almost every culture. <sighs> anyway, pretty cool stuff to me anyway, <clears throat> even though they don't want to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, third fossilization type is carbonization. This process is obtained um, obtained by heat and pressure is basically you're squishing a dead organism until most of what's left is carbon. Uh, sometimes leaves a very detailed sketch behind. Uh, this process can also happen very quickly. You guys ever heard of thermal depolymerization? Once again, your media has failed you like you would not believe. Okay, thermal depolymerization. Fancy schmancy name, thermal, meaning heat. Depolymerization, we're taking a big molecule, we're making it into smaller ones. Like fat. Fat is a huge molecule. That's why it does that blob thing. Right? So we call it blubber. If you if fat falls off the table, that's the sound that it makes. Blubber. Right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, thermal depolymerization. You're using that stuff for a reduction of a complex organic material, usually waste products, into light crude oil. Wait a minute, just wait one second, Mr. Kirby. I thought all the evolutionists have been insisting that millions and millions of years are required to make fossil fuels. Well, the Australians have been doing this for decades, and they can cook up a batch of crude oil in about half an hour. They do this with uh, wastewater. We treat our wastewater plants like the bacteria eat all that stuff, but you could turn it into oil. Forget about recycling plastic, that's a pain. You can make it into oil. For example, uh, let's see, and they're trying to do it, commercialize it, they've got all these patents and stuff. Here we go, here we go. Uh, if you start with plastic bottles, <clears throat> you put them into your little thermal depolymerization machine, you get 70% oils, 16% gases, that's going to be your natural gas, your propane, those kinds of gases. You will get 6% coal. Very high grade coal, and then what's left over is water. Huh. 
Uh, you can use medical waste. It's 65% oil, 10% gas, 5% coal, 20% water. Interesting. Uh, you can take tires. Tires are ridiculously hard to recycle, are they not? What do we do with all these tires that are useless to us? We'll just grind them up and use them for playground stuff. All that stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you can turn them into fossil fuels if you want. Put them into your little thermal depolymerization machine. 44% oil, 10% gas, 42% coal, and 4% water. Voila. Turkey offal. <laughs> Uh, that's a great word, isn't it? Basically, your waste from making turkeys edible. Okay. 39% uh, oil, 6%. You see, you see where we're going here? Poop. 26% <laughs> oil, 9% gases, 8% <laughs> and 57% water. That's a renewable resource. Absolutely. Even on Mars, it is. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it would be more gas in there. How much energy do you think do that? Um, you consume approximately 20% of the energy that you produce in this process. Approximately. I imagine it doesn't smell very nice. <laughs> but neither does a wastewater treatment plant. I bet it costs so much to collect all this. We already collect all of our garbage! How difficult would it be to separate out all the carbon-based stuff? Paper, plastic, you know, uh, you know uh, food waste. Just dump it all in one bit. Here's your, here's your carbon-based waste, and here's your glass and your metal. Glass and metal is really easy to recycle. We can make insulation out of glass. We can, you know, of course, melt the metal down and make more metal out of it. Uh, paper. Forget about recycling paper and making newspapers out of it. Who reads the newspapers anymore? Good heavens. Is there anything worth reading in a newspaper? The Sunday Times. <laughs> yeah, they cut the comic strips. <laughs> You can go paper free. Anyway, um, so you can make you can make oil pretty quickly. Um, why aren't we doing this? Why don't Why doesn't every major city have a thermal depolymerization plant, a waste management management facility? Would it really cost us that much more than dumping it into a giant hole in the ground? Whereas Oklahomans do, building a giant man-made mountain out of it. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Anyway, so we can convert any carbon-based material into some type of um, fossil fuel, a mixture of coal, oil, natural gas, and water. And uh, this dude, actually, we won't get into it right now, but there's all kinds of videos on YouTube of guys who um, have their own little thermal depolymerization machine, and they set it up and they run their truck off of it. Usually, but it takes a, a pretty high pressure to build up in order to get, excuse me, in order to um, get this thing going. Um, but there's a guy, this guy, um, just puts a bunch of wood chips in the back of his truck and runs an old Ford truck on wood gas, 100%, no gasoline. Uses, he can uh, take the hose off of it, plug it into his generator, run his generator off of wood gas. It does not take millions of years to get fossil fuels. It takes heat and pressure. And that's it. Um, several companies are um, making small ones for you know, survival, preppers, um, energy sources for out in the woods, and stuff like that. So uh, why we're not doing this on a larger scale is beyond me. Anyway, this is what it looks like in the fossil record. You see these. Uh, sometimes these very detailed sketches are left behind, mostly carbon. Um, sometimes we find these near coal seams, major coal seams. And, and so it's pretty easy for us to figure out, okay, well, coal seams are probably just a whole bunch of these guys squished together and you can't tell them apart anymore. Okay. Um, basically what you're doing is the same thing that if you took uh, a leaf and put it in a book and made a, uh, a dried leaf or dried flower, uh, pressed flower. Same thing. Um, and sometimes, in that case, you'll get more coal than anything else. Fourth and final type of fossil is the kind that simply avoids decomposition. These are possibly the most rare. Okay. We've seen this with frozen mammoths. Um, there are other types of these fossils. One of the more common ones is actually amber-encased insects. 
Um, they're very well preserved, some of them almost lifelike. This is a common house fly, as best I can tell. Um, I'm not an expert entomologist. My little brother does still hold the state record for entomology judging them. <laughs> so I know a thing or two about him. He's got um, he's Dioptera, Diptera, two wings. Okay, so he's one of the only insects that has just a single pair of wings. All right. Um, the, uh, where the other pair of wings would be is a tiny little knob-like structure we call a halteer, or halteria, however you pronounce that. Um, we used to think that they were a useless evolutionary leftover. Oh yeah, he lost a pair of wings. Obviously, he's evolving. <laughs> kind of like, oh yes, yes, you see? Um, the bird, when birds evolved, evolved from reptiles, they lost their teeth. Yes, that's, that's a perfect illustration of evolution. You lost your teeth. <laughs> Go pull all your teeth out and just tell me how much more involved you are than I am. <laughs> anyway, so, <clears throat> so we used to think this was a useless leftover, you know, from evolution of the fly, which is nonsense. Um, you cut these things off, the thing can't fly. <laughs> Ever wonder why flies can do all that weird stuff they can do? Well, this, this little knob thing has a lot to do with it. It vibrates back and forth enables the fly to be able to change directions and elude fly swatters and just in basically be very annoying. Right? Now this insect has been stuck in this amber for millions of years, right? <laughs> well, if he has, his buddies on the outside really haven't been evolving very much, have they? I mean if I can look at that and go, oh it looks like a common house fly to me. Hmm. Haven't changed much. You know, they did um, uh, experiments with the mice and the cutting off their tails and all that stuff. They did a similar kind of experiments with, with flies to try to mutate them into evolving. And they used chemical mutation, uh, inducing chemicals. They used x-rays and gamma rays and blasted them with x-rays and gamma rays. They did all sorts of horrible things to these poor flies. And they caught, killed them, the flies. Uh, they caused flies to be hatched out with red eyes, you couldn't see as well, they had caused flies to be hatched out that had blue hair on their eyes, they uh, caused flies to be born, or hatched out with no hair, flies with no wings, which I guess would be a land. Um, they have flies with legs for antennas, and flies with, they did all, they did that, hundreds and hundreds of experiments with these silly things. And at the end of it all, the dude that was in charge of the experiment said, well, obviously the flies have reached the limit of evolution. They're not <laughs> evolving anymore after this. And I'm like, you moron! You can't get evolution with mutations. That's why you don't mutate yourself. If you're so convinced that mutations are good for you, go blast yourself with some radiation from a nuclear power plant. Now let me know how much more evolved you are than I am. Anyway. There's a carpenter ant. Most of the time, these guys are dang near identical to modern critters that are running around. Um, occasionally, we find a, an example of an organism that's extinct. Uh, most of the time, we find them and we're like, oh, it's a carpenter ant. Oh, well, which is, this is not a carpenter ant. You know? But um, it, it, basically, to be able to tell the difference between different types of ants, you have to be an unbelievably advanced like doctorate level entomologists because the only difference between them is the segments on their antenna or, or something like that. There, there's not a lot of difference between uh, some of these species. But anyway, so oftentimes we find organisms that are still walking around. Sometimes we find extinct ones. Okay, so those are the three basic, or I'm sorry, the four basic types of fossils. And now we're gonna talk about general features of the fossil record. There are four of them as well. Uh, fossil record is all the fossils we discovered. A lot of the fossils we discovered, we don't even dig out of the ground. <laughs> There's just too many of them. How many fossils of clam do you really need at your house? Seven tons? Probably not. So we just leave them there. Hey, go check out this giant hole in the ground where there's lots of fossils. Um, so, number one. The vast majority of fossils on Earth are hard shell organisms. The bivalves, okay? Dinosaurs, iron mammoths, insects, all those others make an a pathetically small fraction of fossils, way, way less than 1%. Fish are our next most common after bivalves. Um, most scientists agree that more than 95% of fossilized remains are marine invertebrates. 
The second rule of the fossil record is stasis, which is a fancy schmancy way of saying that nothing ever changes. Okay? Most organisms we find in the fossil record look the same no matter where we find them in the fossil record. Some organisms alive today look very much like their fossils. For example, coelacanth. Okay, this is a good example of that. Coelacanth fossils are common in the age of the fishes. Most of them date back to 250 to 300 million years ago, according to all of their um, dating methods. Or I should say their charts. Their dating methods don't always serve them well. Uh, the youngest fossils we have of coelacanth date back to about 70 million years ago. It's kind of interesting that we can tell the coelacanths apart from everything else, isn't it? Because this guy is supposed to be a missing link. Now, it's a weird looking fish, I'll give you that. Oh my gosh, he has this limb in his arm. So instead of, you know, most fish, they just do this, right? They have the little fins on the side of them, and they're like, what's up? This guy can actually do this. So he's a missing link between fishes and amphibians. He's one of the best examples they've had of that, okay? Um, until they started educating people in Africa about evolution. One of the Africans was like, Oh, no, 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 sir. I catch three of these every day. This is not an extinct creature. I, I got one in the back of my truck. <laughs> what? You do not. It's not a secret. Show it to me. Voila. It's still alive. Now, it's a weird looking fish. I'll give you that. But I don't think this is an uh, intermediate form between fish and amphibians. I think it's very much a fish. <laughs> We have the operculum, which is the little shield that covers their gills. We have, okay, it's a weird looking fin. Look at that. Um, interestingly enough, this is a deep water fish. This is not somebody, you know, walking around on shore, maybe getting ready to emerge from. No. This is just a fish. Trust me, there are weirder fishes than this guy out there. All right? So if you're an evolutionist, you have to believe that this guy you know, had some offspring millions, you know, 200 million years ago, he had some offspring that were a little bit more involved than him. And he didn't quite die out though, so his offspring were a little bit more involved, evolved, and they had a little bit better limbs, and they start, you know, developing lungs and, and uh, water-tight-ish skin, and, and they can emerge from the water for a short periods of time and breathe the air, which is, you know, slowly accumulating oxygen from all these algae that are all over the place. And, um, and then those creatures, after they crawled up out of the land, you know, they decided to grow some hair, and they crawled underneath the rocks, and they lived underneath the rocks for millions of years. And after millions of years, these creatures decided to grow some more hair and eat bananas up in trees. And so they kind of did that thing for a couple million years. And then they decided to get a haircut and go to J.C. Penney and buy themselves a suit. And here we are. But these guys didn't change. During that whole period of time, and I don't know how many extinction events they're up to now, coelacanth hasn't changed a single bit. Okay, maybe he's a different species of coelacanth, but um, pretty much it's a coelacanth. This is not the only example of a living fossil. Right, again, you can see those at Walmart as well. You get there early on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> Uh, this is the oldest known fossil bat. Isn't that interesting? It's a bat. Should it be something, uh, I don't know, half bat? Supposedly 52 million years old, probably did not have echolocation based on a detailed study of his inner ear and all that uh, funny business. However, it's quite a large skeleton. It looks an awful lot to me like megabat. Megabats today you don't need to have megabats and microbats. Microbats are the insectivores that do all the echolocation and live in caves. My, or, uh, megabats live in the tropics and they eat fruit and nectar. And they don't have echolocation. Okay? And their skulls look more like this. And, and I, you know, I'm not an expert on bats. Um, but basically, this guy is identical to a modern bat skeleton. I mean, if you squish this guy underneath a mile of rock, he's going to look just like that. <laughs> on his best day, right? Yeah, we have the long fingers, we have a long bony tail, we have 
no evolution for 52 million years. Once again, Tom Kemp, universe, uh, 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 curator for whatever museum he was, he was big time evolutionist. Um, he's basically saying, look, this bat, poof, it appears in the fossil record, it's fully formed. It's a bat. No evolution at all for millions of years. Until you get to the modern ones, is look for all the world, just like the ones that you see in the fossils. Right? And this is also a mega bat and does not have echolocation. So how do evolutionists then explain that like this did not evolve, but we used to be whatever they say we used to be? Yeah, 50, 52 million years ago, humans weren't even evolved yet, right? Some kind of ape thing was running around, maybe. Mm -hmm. 50 million years ago, horses hadn't even, even evolved yet, according to evolution. Um, so again, the biologists pretty much ignore this. And this is the problem of specialism, one of about a thousand problems, with specialists, right? They know about biology, they don't know anything else. They are dumber than a bag of hammers when it comes to paleontology, right? The paleontologists are saying, hey, 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 it's a bat. It's always been a bat. We're going to call it, we're going to say it punctuated equilibrium. Because you look at the fossil record, it's like it's all the same. No bats, no bats, no bats, no bats, no bats, no bats, no bats. Bats! There they are. So punctuated equilibrium is the only thing that they have for this. One day, a squirrel birthed out this unholy offspring of Satan. Right? <laughs> Which bats are not really all that, even though Ebola came from bats. You know, they're disease reservoirs. They also do lots of good for us. They eat, uh, what? Mosquitoes. They, I, I, they can eat something like three times their weight in insects in one night. Yeah. I think I'd like some bats. Thank you very much. I'll get, I'll take the risk for Ebola, which turned out to be not that big of a deal anyway. <clears throat> so yeah, you don't have much evolution in the bats. You uh, maybe do have some evolution with the armadillos. They're much smaller today than they used to be. This is Glyptodon. Uh, as far as we can tell, he's basically identical to a modern armadillo, except he's nine times the size. <laughs> Remember I told you we'd revisit this whole thing that everything was bigger back in those days? Yeah. I don't think you'd want him digging holes in your garden. <laughs> um, this reminds me of that scene in uh, Ice Age where, <laughs> oh, where's Vern? Well, he said he was on the verge of an evolutionary breakthrough. And then Vern's like jumping off the cliff, I'm flying! It's not breakthrough. <laughs> That's basically what I think of evolution, right? <laughs> so, anyway, armadillos used to get to be pretty big. We have fossils of beavers that reach 275 pounds. It's quite a bit larger than their modern counterparts. What does a 275 pound beaver eat? Anything that it wants. <laughs> Fossils haven't changed, or excuse me, fossils of turtles haven't changed much. This is pretty close to uh, something like an alligator snappy turtle today that has its long tail, right? This, um, this is an extinct species of turtles found in the Green River Formation. Um, I think this one's about 12 inches across, so pretty much, pretty much the same as modern turtles. Oh, except they used to get bigger too. <laughs> this is Archelon, or flipper span of 60. He feet may have reached almost 5,000 pounds. Probably had a leathery shell today, like uh, today's leatherback turtles. And I was like, oh, you didn't have a modern turtle shell. Neither does a leatherback shell turtle. <laughs> this is probably a, you know, a leatherback turtle back in those days, right? Back when the earth was uh, Mobetta. <laughs> so that's Archelon. That's not even the biggest turtle. Stupendimus. Pandemies. <laughs> Scientists are not very creative. <laughs> it was even larger. Largest freshwater, this guy apparently looks like a freshwater turtle today that's nearly identical, but only reaches 30 inches in size. Again, with stasis, except that they used to be bigger. This is a fossil of a nautilus over here on the left. This is a living nautilus over here on the right thought to have been extinct for 500 million years. There are no fossils of Nautilus in the fossil record for 500 million years, and then we caught one alive. 
So we find fossils of these guys, I believe they're about nine feet across. This one's maybe six inches across. So they used to get bigger. Have I seen that before? <laughs> I think we have a little pattern here. And it's hard to see, but there, there is actually a link to a whole list of living fossils. We've beat this horse enough, we're going to move on here. Uh, fossil of ground sloths uh, used to be the size of elephants, weighing over 8,000 pounds. Speaking of elephants, the largest mammal ever to live was apparently a rhinoceros, reaching perhaps 44,000 pounds and standing 16 feet tall at the shoulder. <laughs> wow. That's a big animal. Okay, so stasis in the fossil record. Nothing ever changes except it used to get bigger. Right? I think the largest fossil crocodile we've ever found was like 50 feet long. No, no, rule number three it is extinction. We see a lot of extinction in the fossil record, no doubt about it. Maybe not as much as the evolutionists claim. We have only 97 percent of all species that are on the face of the earth are extinct. I don't think so. If you're just looking at kinds, yeah, there's been a lot of extinction, but I think 97 percent is more like 40 or 50 percent. Anyway, I'm not an expert again. Uh, so, an entire kind of organism dies out, we say they are extinct. Nam is safer to extinct. Two tigers, most dinosaurs. I don't know what else you call it, Komodo dragon. It's a dinosaur, or a terrible lizard. They're actually venomous, and their saliva has lots of bacteria in it. <laughs> so, uh, we have lots of extinction going on. Again, not as much as you might have heard about. Since 1600, approximately 484 species of animal and 654 species of plant have gone extinct. Well, out of 2 million, that doesn't sound so bad. Hmm. There are some environmental swackos out there. 10,000 species gone extinct every hour. We gotta stop the rainforest from being cut down. Well, okay, I agree with you about the rainforest thing, but seriously, go get a haircut and uh, bathe in something. And yeah, there's not 10,000 species that go extinct every hour. Okay. Um, certainly, there are a lot of species that are closer to extinction now than there were 50 years ago, uh, and that's definitely something to be concerned about. But I'm trying to make the point that. It's maybe not as drastic as we thought it was. You know, some evolutionists are like, oh, we're going through an extinction event right now. It's caused by humans. Okay, yeah, yeah, some of it has been caused by humans. We cut down the rainforest. It's ridiculous. We have cut down almost all of the rainforest. And who's doing it? People in third world countries have no other way to feed themselves. What's the solution? Ecotourism is probably the best one. Um, Costa Rica is a great example of uh, what's possible, what's possible to do with ecotourism, how we can build an economy off of that, and not cut down your rainforest and burn it so that your soil is relatively fertile. So rule number three is extinction. You see lots of that in the fossil record. Again, not maybe as much as Bill and I have talked to you about. The fourth General feature of the fossil record is that fossils in different layers of strata tend to be, as I said, they tend to be, not always, very different from each other. This was one of two evidences for evolution that Charles Darwin had. He only had the two. This is one of them. That if you look through the layers of the fossil record, those organisms tend to be very different from each other. And I'll agree with that. That is a general feature of the fossil record. I'm not disputing the evidence, okay? I'm just disputing its interpretation of the evidence. Yes, they're very different. So are organisms that live on the bottom of the ocean compared to savanna organisms, or desert organisms, or jungle organisms. They live in different environments. They're designed for different things. You get down to the bottom of the ocean, there are some things down there that are almost unclassifiable, siphonophores, crazy stuff like that. So anyway, but we do see this pattern. Usually, not always, but usually we see this pattern. We have fossils of worms at the bottom, trilobites in several layers after that. They occur, they occur in more than one, almost identical through all of them. Um, we have plated fish only in the one layer above that. And then you get to amphibians, reptiles, and then you get modern fish. 
So, there's two explanations for this phenomenon. One is uniformitarianism, right? Everything's been going on the same rate for millions of years. And this later lived and died out, right? They were fossilized. They all them died out. They evolved into these guys who lived for millions of years, and then they died out, and they evolved into these guys. All these guys died out. These guys evolved from them, and then they lived for millions of years, and then they, you know, as they were evolving, these guys got fossilized, but the rest of them evolved, right? There's also a catastrophe explanation that these layers were formed, most of them, the vast majority of the fossil record, formed during a crisis we call Noah's Flood. And they got buried according to where they lived. Stuff that lived further down got buried first. The things with higher densities, like shellfish, sink to the bottom. Whales have a ridiculous buoyancy. They're not going to find fossils of whales down at the bottom. They'll find them way up at the top. Makes sense. Trilobites, crustaceans, no, not crustaceans, I'm sorry, yeah. arthropods. You find them down at the bottom. They're not going to find them up at the top. They don't live higher than that. You wouldn't find, a, you know, if a trilobite was alive today, you wouldn't find it, you know, in the parking lot out here. They live hundreds of feet under the water. So those are, are two different interpretations of the data. We're going to just, uh, investigate which one we think might fit the evidence better. Okay, so it's important for us to pause for a little bit before we get into that and realize that if macroevolution were true, at least the first two flavors of it, neo-Darwinism being evolution by mutation, which is taught in every public school in America, or Darwinism, which nobody believes anymore, if any one of those were true, there would be no fossils except intermediate forms. You should not be able to tell the difference between organisms millions of years ago. It shouldn't be so easy to fit them into our classification system. It's not always easy. I'm not trying to say that it's always easy. I'm just saying, oftentimes, it's pretty simple. There should be no such thing as stasis. And it certainly should not be one of the four general features of the fossil record. Stasis should never happen, far, be, far from being the rule. It should never be an exception to a rule. That these things are slowly evolving. But it's there. Uh, what did Darwin say? Um, in his book, by the way, you should go get the older editions of the Origins of the Species. You know, like your skin crawl, this guy said. But um, anyway, uh, the newer editions have edited a lot of this stuff out. Um, geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. Remember our little stepping stones across the canyon? He's saying there's, not, there's no evidence of that. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Did you know that on the origin of the theories, the original on the origin of the theories, uh, um, on the origin of the species, had two whole chapters devoted to reasons why you probably should just reject the theory. Did you know that Darwin did not have a doctorate? He did graduate from college. Do you know what his major was? Theology. At one point, he said that the Old Testament was uh, very accurate. We have quotes of him as a young man. You know what happened to him? He started hanging out with some old earthers. He started pouring, poisoning his mind. Oh, yes, yeah, so you see all these different layers of theology? I have a question on that theology. You can see he didn't have a science background. They will say, no, I, I think these might have formed as a result of a great flood. They taught him the Bible. They didn't teach him the science. They knew the science. There were flood geologists running around at the time who could have taught him that. But they didn't. For some reason. So anyway, so Darwin claimed that paleontology was still a brand new science, right? That moron, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, the curator of that museum was like, well, it's one of the oldest professions. No, it's only been around for about 150 years. There are lots of professions older than that, pal. So anyway, that was 156 years ago when Darwin's claiming, oh, paleontology is still a little baby. They said, we've just begun to study fossils. We haven't even dug enough holes yet. We'll find intermediate forms. They'll, they'll be found. In fact, you guys go out and find them. We'll talk about how well that went in a couple of chapters here. But um, so surely we've found a couple of intermediate forms in the 156 years, 157 now, 
since On the Origin of the Species was published. So let's go to the evolutionists. Dr. Patterson is a world-renowned fossil expert. He wrote the book Evolution. This dude wrote the book and taught the class on evolution. And uh, one of his students wrote to him and said, hey, I read your book. It was great. However, I noticed you didn't have any examples of transitional forms in your book Evolution. And you're a paleontologist. Why didn't you have at least some illustrations? And he comes back and he says, well, I fully agree. This is a quote from Dr. Patterson, who was an evolutionist. He had no idea where we get this, but this is correspondence between him and a student. I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any possible living, I would have included them. Okay. He suggested an artist should be used to visualize such transformations. Where would he get the information from? <laughs> There's no evidence of this. I could not provide it honestly. Well, this guy, we have found ourselves an honest scientist, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you guys were sitting down and you heard that. If I were to leave it to our artistic license, would that not mislead the reader? Well, I would like to take this guy to lunch. Uh, he goes on, he says, um, uh, yet Gould, again, Stephen J. Gould, one of the greatest paleontologists who ever walked the face of the earth, um, taught at Harvard. American museum people are hard to contradict and they say there are no transitional fossils. You say I should at least show a photo of the fossil from which each type of organism was derived. I will lay it on the line. There is no such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. So is this just a matter of pride, do you think, that like I've staked my whole reputation on this and I can't I don't, know. I don't know. It's a. It's very interesting that this guy is not a creationist. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the one of the major reasons why evolution is still around. Which again, when I was going through college, I thought I was probably wasting my time because no one would no one would believe in evolution by the time I graduated. <laughs> evolution's been around for thousands of years. It'll be around for thousands more if the Lord carries. Um, He's trusting other people for his evidence. Other specialists. When I debated Dr. Lamoureux, I asked him what he thought the best evidence for evolution was, and he said radioisotopic dating. He has no idea what a radioisotopic dating is. He's never done any of the research. He's never even met anybody who's done the research. He's trusting the radioisotope guys. And I've seen the way they do their research. And if you call that science, I've got some beachfront property in Kansas I'd like to sell you. You know? If I did my science, my lab reports, the way they do theirs, I, you know, my professor would have laughed at me the way that I laugh at them. Um, they're, they're convinced that there's evolution evidence out there, they just don't have it. They don't see evolution. Everybody else does, so surely it's true. You know, they see the red blood cells in the T-Rex bones, but since they're so convinced that everybody else sees the evidence in their fields that they'll trust the radioisotope guys and the paleontologists and the biologists and the, all of these other professions to have the evidence of evolution. When you go and you look at them one by one by one by one, they'll all point to the next guy and say, he has the evidence because they don't have it. And if you can catch them flat-footed, and this guy didn't even know creationists existed, um, that's how well his indoctrination went. Um, he has since figured out that creationists exist and been very much more careful about what he says maybe, that we might get our grubby gunpowder stained fingers on. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, so he doesn't see any evidence for evolution in what he studies. And he's being honest about that but he's trusting that everybody else has the evidence. The emperor doesn't have any clothes, but nobody's admitting it because everyone else sees it, right? You see it, don't you? But you have the evidence, but this guy has the evidence. And it's, you know, there's no pee under the shelves. They're all empty. Uh, and you can check out the uh, quote there. I got it from a creationist website, I'll admit it. Now, I want to be totally fair to Dr. Patterson. He didn't mean it that way, okay? He's saying you couldn't make a watertight argument 
he's saying you couldn't, you, you know, he doesn't want to mislead his readers. But he includes in his book three examples of transitional forms. Okay? Only three. There should be about 3,000. But he has three. He proposes several intermediate forms in, in relation to horses and rhinos. He proposes Archaeopteryx as an intermediate form, which when I hear that, I'm, okay, that's ridiculous. Again, he's, he's trying to be honest about his evidence and say this is not that great. <laughs> Okay, we'll see why he's being so cautious about this. Uh, and he's also proposing um, that we find intermediate forms of peanut diseases of fish. Dr. Patterson is rightfully admitting that we can never be sure that these are, in fact, intermediate forms. But we can study these for ourselves, okay? It doesn't take a doctorate to figure some of this stuff out. So let's look at all of, all of these examples from one of the greatest experts on evolution, um, alive and see if they match scientific crit criteria for being evidence for transitional forms. Uh, let's see, so if you go to this website, it's the LA Times, right, part of the secular science media, and they're all excited because they found a, uh, oh, for heaven's sake, really? Oh yes, look, this is an intermediate form between this, uh, this guy who gave rise to rhinos and horses. There's a branch. This guy is a branch for it. That's an Okapi, isn't it? You don't, don't say that! <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy is 55 million years old and um, probably lived in the forest. And this is what his skin looked like. You know, we don't have any idea what his skin looked like. It's the rhino horse. You know, he has hooves, which aren't really hooves. They're more like claws that kind of look like hooves. And it's the size of a wild pig might help solve a 55 million year old mystery. Likely weighed 45 to 75 pounds, occupied a branch of the evolutionary tree right beside a broad group that has since radiated out into modern rhinoceros' horse and hippopotamus. According to a study, they named it that fancy name. They described him nine years ago. He's a missing link. And um, transitional form, it's a missing link. I don't like the term because all fossils are missing links. Oh, you just can't see it. Right? Okay. 200 bones. Blah, blah, blah. Transitional form. They're all excited about it. They're thumping their chest with it. It's a, um, someone could come along and say it's a primitive. Per it's a, a parasodactyl is talking about how many digits it has. You know, a, three, or a horse has one, a rhino has four. So the ancestor of a horse had to have some, either one of those two. The horses have lost their digits, apparently, as they evolved. Again, you lose the fingers, you're about. sure about this? So they're all excited about it. You know, this is one of the examples that Dr. Patterson gives in his book on evolution, right? Unfortunately, we have horse fossils that are older than this guy. So sorry to bring this up. In Uzbekistan, we see 86 consecutive horse hoof prints found beside supposedly 90 to 100 million year old dinosaur tracks. We actually have good horse fossils millions of, tens of millions of years before males are supposed to have evolved. Interesting. So any other kind of creature that makes a hoof print that looks like a horse? <laughs> I'll have to think about that in the back to you. Uh, evolutionists have almost as much difficulty believing that horses and dinosaurs live together as they do believing that man and dinosaurs live together. Horses allegedly did not did not evolve until millions of years after um, dinosaurs became extinct. This is a Russian um, book, a horse from the dinosaur epoch. Of course, the Soviet Union was very, 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 very much sold on the idea of evolution. So it's a little bit dangerous for these guys to be publishing this. Um, anyway, you can look it up here. Uh, <coughs> There's another one, uh, human and mammal tracks found together with the tracks of dinosaurs in Cayeta, Arizona. He posts some evidence that um, there are horse fossils down there, again, millions of years before even mammals are supposed to have evolved. And again, remember what I talked about, we usually find the fossils in a particular order, but not always. There are exceptions to the rule. There shouldn't be, but there are. And guess how long we've known about it? 
Second. Anyway, maybe the archaeopteryx will be nicer. Let's move on to something that's quite not so naughty. Is it? Or a little evolutionist. They haven't won anything so far. I've got to be. You've got to be nice to them. They'll take their ball and go home with them. We're not careful. Uh, so maybe the archaeopteryx will be a better transitional form. Okay. Uh, so, this creature was actually found fossilized during Darwin's lifetime. It was taken as very strong evidence in favor of evolution. Oh, look! Darwin said we find transitional forms. Here's a perfect example of a transitional form we just found. At first glance, the case seems pretty strong. We have a weak flying bird. A lot of um, folks claim it had to climb the tree and glide down. It has teeth in its bill. It's quite unusual. It has claws on its wings, three claws on each wing. It has a long bony tail. It looks for all the world like a half reptile, half bird thing. Huh. Well, if you were 12 years old sitting in a biology classroom and they showed you a picture of that, and they said, look, this guy lived millions of years ago. He lived before birds evolved, right? He's got, he doesn't have a bill. He has this little beak, or, uh, not a beak, but uh, he's got teeth. Uh, in his mouth here, he's got these uh, weird looking claws on his wings, how he couldn't fly very well, his wings are very small, underdeveloped, he's got this long tail, feathers mostly for decoration, right? Hmm. Unfortunately, then science happened. The original discoveries were not that good. They weren't very well preserved, and so, again, an artistic license took over. Evolutionists speculated that it doesn't have a strong keel bone. The keel bone is this bone right down the middle of the bird, which you've seen if you've ever gotten a, a chicken, like a roasted chicken. And that's what the pectoral muscles are attached to, right? So if you're gonna have a strong flying motion, you gotta have a big pectoral muscle, and you gotta have a, a prominent keel bone to attach those muscles to, right? Archaeopteryx did not have that, and so therefore, he was considered to be a weak flyer. However, more recent finds have showed perfectly preserved flight feathers on this bird, I'm going to call it a bird. And because of strong muscle attachment points on the pelvis, we know it to be a strong flyer, strong enough to take off from the ground. Okay. Furthermore, we found fossils of Archaeopteryx that are so well preserved that we noticed that there are no scratches on his fingernails. So he never used them to climb anything, as far as we can tell. Now, we recognize he had a strong keel bone. I'm not saying that he migrated to the Arctic and back every year, okay, like the Arctic Turn or something like that. Uh, there are many birds alive today, perfectly modern, that are weaker flyers than Archaeopteryx. Ostriches and swans, of course, uh, can't fly at all. Uh, but ostriches and swans also have claws on their wings. Several extinct species of bird have toothed bills. So what's the big deal? He looks a lot like a bird to me. Okay, okay, I grant you, it's a weird looking bird. But everything on it looks like a bird to me. And an extinct kind of bird. There used to be more variety of birds, now we don't have as much, right? <clears throat> well, let's talk to the evolutionists. Dr. Alan Fiducia, who's an evolutionist and a world authority on birds, says paleontologists have tried turning archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. Well, uh, it's kind of hard on your little transitional form there, Dr. Patterson. Hmm. Well, that isn't enough for you. And it, it does get a little bit better for the evolutionists, okay? Uh, Archaeopteryx did have some lizard like skeletal features that don't have a beak, it lacks fused vertebrae in its back, like all modern birds do. It has skull attachment at the rear instead of on the bottom, right? You and I have a skull that's attached on the bottom. We can kind of look around a little bit better. He has a skull attachment on the rear, getting better reach, but again, not like a modern bird. So some evolutionists will still argue that it's more reptile than bird and it represents a true change of form, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, it gets worse for them. We now know it had lungs like a modern bird. It had air sacs surrounding its lungs. So birds actually breathe in, they fill these air sacs with with air, and when they breathe out, all that oxygen-rich air is flowing back through their lungs. So the, the whole time that they're breathing, they have oxygen-rich air flowing through their lungs. A very efficient way of building yourself a ridiculous metabolism if you're gonna be flying all the time, okay? So Archaeopteryx had that same type of lung, perfectly modern bird lung, okay? 
Uh, modern birds are sometimes found in the exact same layer as Archaeopteryx. And in one case, even lower. A bird which is unquestionably a true bird has been found, which dates by the evolutionist's own methods at 60 million years older than Archaeopteryx. It was announced in Science News in September 1997. Excuse me, 1977. I had a little dyslexic moment there. <laughs> the quotes, an evolutionist teaches at Yelp. In this down look for the ancestors of flying birds in a period of time much older than that in which Archaeopteryx lived. Archaeopteryx does not work as an intermediate form. It's even worse than that weird looking rhino thing, which is actually a hard rise. This is a more accurate picture of Archaeopteryx. Hmm. Doesn't look so strange to me. I mean, there's tropical birds that look weirder than that, that are perfectly modern birds. He's more flexible than most birds. He's got his skull attached to the rear instead of, at the, instead of on the bottom. But he's not a transitional form. It's ridiculous. All right, we'll finish up the transitional forms uh, next week. All right? Any questions? I won't even mention that um, one of the, and this is something my professor told me. Oh, did you know they found a dinosaur with feathers on it? It was a complete hoax. <laughs> came, out of, came out of China. They had uh, taken two different fossil organisms and put them together. Yeah. Unfortunately, evolutionists are so desperate for evidence that they'll accept it without really looking into it. And it turned out that this was a complete fabrication. But I thought we found other dinosaurs with feathers. Well, we'll talk about that next week. Maybe. Doubt it, but we'll talk about that. So how often does this time? We, you know, we, we find one of these guys trumpeted throughout the press. Finally! So shut up, those stupid creationists. And we examine it more carefully, and uh, it turns out to be nothing at all. So sorry. All right. See you guys next week. Week after. Oh, the week after. Sorry, we won't have. We won't have. It will be next week. Thank you.